thank you everybody for coming. It's exciting to see everyone. This is a great group of people. Um, some are of our old friends and new friends, it appears. Uh, so my name is Linda Kellum. Um, welcome to the NCLA Government Resources Section's HELP. I'm an Accidental Government Information Librarian webinar series, or HELP for short. Um, thank you for coming, and I'll, um, after I hand over to Jeremy, I'll give some links to some resources for learning more about NCLA and also our YouTube channel. So today, we have uh, a webinar that we're very excited about. I'm, uh, Jeremy has presented for us, I think, a couple of times at this point. Um, uh, yeah, at least twice. Yeah, at on least election. twice. Yeah, election topics, and he's, it's always fun. He always learns so much from his webinars, so I'm really excited to have him here. Um, this one is called, What Were They Thinking? Exploring America's Voting Preferences and Ad Attitudes Using the American National Election Study. Um, and Jeremy is the politics librarian at P Princeton University Library. He has a BA in International Studies from Brigham Young University and graduate degrees in Library and Information Sciences from the University of Washington and in Political Science from UC Berkeley. He is a past chair of the policy, politics, policy, and international relations sections of ACRL. And he recently received the Marta Lang Sage CQ Press Award for Distinguished Contributions in, to Librarianship and Political Science. Yay, congratulations. Thank um, you. I just got my plaque this week. <laughs> oh, sweet. Oh, uh, I wish we could have uh, had some champagne in person, but we, uh, it was a great <laughs> celebration. Um, uh, Jeremy is happily married and a proud father of four children. All right. So welcome, everybody. I'm glad to do this. Um, and just to follow up on what Linda was saying just a minute ago, um, if you don't volunteer, she's also totally comfortable in just like calling on you and asking you to do something. So uh, that's how I end up getting roped into these things. I think every single time Linda has just said, you know, I, we need you to do a webinar. I say, OK. Um, Anyway, this is a good topic. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff covering elections and especially in election years. Um, you know, like many of you, I get lots of questions about elections, about public opinion uh, related to elections and politics. Um, and I get stuff come in from people all around the country and even sometimes uh, from around the world. Um, and uh, it's a fun topic, right? I, you know, I think there's a lot uh, going on um, with this topic. And especially in a very polarized environment, which we uh, have been for, you know, at least um, a couple of electoral cycles and, and depending on how you read the research, um, at least, you know, 20, 30 years increasingly. Um, it's, I think it's useful for us to sort of uh, try to explore a bit more deeply um, what drives people's voting preferences um, and what we can learn from that. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, I will just say, you know, I'm not an expert in public opinion polling. Um, there are political scientists who this is their whole career is just working in sort of public opinion methodology. Um, very sophisticated work in political science dealing with lots and lots of interesting questions related to this. Um, but I do get a lot of questions about this, as may some of you. Um, and your reference stuff. So just kind of taking the broad view here on sort of public opinion polling. It, it matters because, you know, elections can tell us what people uh, choose, who they choose um, to vote for, but they don't tell us why, right? That's the big question that's always left unanswered. And for social scientists, uh, I'm just the interested public, you know, we kind of want to know, like, well, why did people vote the way they did, right? Um, you know, you can vote for somebody uh, as an affirmation. You can vote for somebody um, as a protest against somebody else or against some other kind of a system. You can vote specifically just because of a single issue that really drives you. Um, there are lots and lots of reasons, and we don't know anything because of the secret ballot about who votes uh, the way they do and why they vote uh, the way they do. So we have to rely on survey data to help us figure that out. Um, you know, the genesis of, of public opinion polling, especially political opinion polling in the United States, um, really kind of takes off uh, in the late 1930s, and especially into the 1940s with Gallup and, and Elmo Roper. Um, and you know, they really pioneered a lot of this. And it's become more sophisticated, obviously, over time. The methods have improved a lot. Some of the early surveys in those early uh, decade or two suffered from a lot of methodological problems that we only subsequently learned that, you know, uh, about sampling and about how to uh, properly control for particular issues that uh, might introduce error or bias into our surveys. And we'll talk a little bit more about what some of those things are uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, 
you know, and if you want to know what people think, uh, obviously, ideally, it would be to be able to figure out like what every single person in the United States uh, thinks, um, you know, but with roughly, I don't know, 255 million adults in the United States, asking everybody is, is just a little bit cost prohibitive. So uh, that's why we use surveys, right? And surveys, in order to be representative, have to use some kind of a random sample of the total population. So I'm going to talk really briefly and in just sort of uh, general terms about some of the kind of key terms related to public opinion polling. I'm not going to go into depth. If people have questions, we can certainly take some of those. Um, and I'm sure many of you are already familiar with some of these things. But the general idea is that if we have a population of interest, like the entire adult population in the United States, like I said, that's 255 million people. Um, in order to figure out what those people think, you know, we can't just stand on a street corner and ask, you know, uh, a thousand people what they think about certain things, because that's going to be a really skewed sample, right? We're only going to see a certain segment of the population, depending on which corner we choose to stand on, which city, what part of the country, what time of day even. Um, and so in order to make sure that this, the surveys that we do are at least going to be somewhat uh, or fairly representative of the general adult opinion in the United States, we have to provide for some way of random sampling of the population, taking just a few people to represent the whole. Now, if we go just a little bit more in detail in sampling, a couple of things are really important, right? So the randomness is really important. Um, obviously, if it's not random, um, we've introduced a whole bunch of bias already directly into the survey, and we can't rely at all on the results that we get being representative of the general population. All right, so when we say random, we just mean that everybody in that total universe, sometimes they call it a universe, sometimes they just call it the total population, that you're trying to represent, everybody in that population has to have at least the same chance of being sampled, right? Now, obviously, you start thinking about uh, that. There can be uh, real challenges to doing that in the United States, uh, as in many countries. Um, but, and we'll talk about a little bit more about that in a minute. But that's the idea in principle, is that everybody should have the same chance of, of falling into that sample, right? Now, in practice, um, you know, with surveys, usually they employ something that we typically call a stratified probability sample, which is to say that what they want to do instead of just like, you know, a random sampling of the entire adult population, if we want to make sure that it's representative of kind of key groups that we're interested in knowing their opinions, then we need to make sure that the, the sample frame itself has some way of making sure that it captures at least a representative sample of some of those subpopulations. For example, uh, different uh, racial categories like Blacks or Hispanics, um, you know, registered voters versus non-registered voters, rural people versus urban people, people that live in the South versus the Northeast, right? All those things um, are things that we'd want to take into account when we think about building our sample. So all we mean by stratified probability sample here is that, you know, if we know we want to represent geographic regions of the country, then we better make sure that we don't just take a random sampling of all 255 million people in the country, but that we then choose, you know, some segment and say like, you know, 300 people in our sample are going to come from the South, 300 from the West, 300 from the North, uh, 300 from the Midwest, uh, and so on and so forth, right? Now, the methods for doing this varies. Um, they can vary uh, based on organizations. You know, they're all different organizations that do sort of public opinion may use slightly different methods for their sampling. But most of the uh, differences in sampling tend to vary based on sort of the administration of the survey instrument itself. So you know, typically you have kind of three main ways. Either you, you interview people face to face. So you send, you train an interviewer, you send them to somebody's house and you know, they will interview somebody in that household. And those will usually use some kind of area probability sampling, right? So you basically you take a map of the United States, you divide it up into those different segments you want. Um, you use different seg census figures to represent different subpopulations in the United States and say, like, we got to make sure we get enough people to match those things. And then within those sort of subgroupings, you take a random sample, right? Phone surveys, um, which obviously um, for many decades were uh, one of the most common uh, ways of running a public opinion poll, uh, simply because it's much, much cheaper, right, than to send somebody in person to a whole bunch of different parts of the country. Uh, that's really costly. So to do over the phone is much uh, easier to do. Um, and in the past, those, when everybody had a landline, they would rely on random digit dialing, right? So because area codes represent different areas of the United States, and then um, uh, the phone number itself, the first three digits, would then represent different parts of a city or a region even. You, know, you could use random digit dialing with variations on the methods to do that to represent you know, certain areas so that you could know you got part of uh, your sample from the place that you had targeted to get your sample from. Now, that's become a lot more difficult over the last uh, number of years, last decade or two, with the rise of cell phones. 
obviously, as you know, when you have your cell phone, it will represent an area code, but you don't have to live there anymore. And you can take your phone with you when you move. So, uh, and one of the other actual big issues is the FCC um, has regulations that mean that you can't auto dial, um, like from phone banks, you can't have uh, computers auto dial cell phone numbers, right? So it's against the law and you can incur really big fees. So survey firms have to actually hand dial those, which is really tedious and very costly. So over time, uh, increasingly, you know, many surveys have moved to sort of more hybrid methods uh, where they combine different administration forms um, and increasingly using the internet, obviously. Um, and now you can do that in different ways. Um, in many cases, you know, you can actually use the postal addresses to create your sample, send out an invitation, maybe with some kind of incentive, like 20 bucks in cash. So, you know, go take our survey and if you fill out the survey and finish it, then we'll give you another, you know, 20, 30 dollars or whatever. Um, they also, uh, many survey firms now also increasingly are using sort of these opt-in panels. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, obviously, those aren't going to be representative because they're not uh, being sampled. Everybody has the same chance of being in those. But they have different ways of sort of correcting after the fact uh, to match up uh, people's responses based on what share of the population they might represent. All right. So it looks like somebody has a question here on... Yes, so on, uh, we're gonna get to that in just a second about question with cell phones and do people answer them or not, right? So that falls under uh, this sort of next general category of survey error and bias, right? So it's important to understand that there are lots of different ways that surveys can have errors or bias in, uh, introduced into them, right? Um, there are a couple of major categories and we're just gonna sort of briefly go through these. The first would be sampling. Error, right. So this is uh, derives from the fact that you might interview only a, a, a sample rather than the entire population. Right. So this is actually a statistical feature. Right. Um, we know we're not interviewing all 255 million adults in the United States population. We're going to interview just a, a small, small subset of that. And so necessarily, there's going to be some amount of just error uh, introduced by the fact that we're not interviewing every single person, right? This is of all the types of error that are introduced in surveys. This is really the only one that we can actually quantify and know statistically um, about what size it is, right? And that's it's important to to note that and and pay attention to that. Usually, we'll refer to that in surveys as as sort of the margin of error. I'm going to pop out of the survey here real quick and show you. There's Various calculators, you can look at this online. SurveyMonkey's got a nice one where you can sort of see the effects of this. Um, and like I said, you know, there's really complicated, it's not super complicated, but there's math. But if you look at this, most of us go, ah, I don't want to know anything about that. I don't understand what that means. But um, the general idea is that, you know, there's statistical uh, methods behind this that can help us gauge what the margin of error is going to be based on the total population size you're working with, as well as the confidence level you want. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, as well as the desired sort of margin of error, right? So like I said, there are about 255 million uh, US adults in the United States. So this is a sort of a conventional confidence level, 95%. We'll get to this in just a minute. So let's say you want to target different levels of error in your survey. So if we were shooting for sort of a 3% error, you'd need about only 1,000 people, about 1,100 people to pretty accurately represent the adult population of the United States. That's actually pretty remarkable when you think about it, right? Um, if we want to go, um, higher if we're willing to tolerate a much higher margin of error, although still not grossly high, right? You'd only need to interview about 400 people to be, you know, roughly representative of the United States population of adults. We wanted to go smaller than that. We might go to like 2%. You can see this sample size increases and, you know, you sort of have decreasing returns on this. Uh, the more larger your sample size doesn't continue to decrease your margin of error at the same rate, right? So most uh, surveys will tend to run around 2 or 3% because uh, it's a fairly acceptable margin of error. There's not a big difference between sort of 2 and 3%. And the sample sizes make this much, much cheaper, right? Like, you know, if to go to 2%, we have to more than double our sample size. Well, then um, most of us are like, well, we can tolerate 3%, right? Because it can be much cheaper to do that. Um, so to talk a little bit more about what that means, right? Um, if you look at an example, here's a recent survey. I was just looking at this yesterday or the day before. Uh, YouGov, um, which is a polling firm, just put out another poll, um, sort of the horse race kind of poll about the general election, in which they show uh, voters, registered voters, um, supporting Biden 49% to Trump 40%, right? 
So a lot of us will see that headline, 49% to 40% and think, well, Biden's got a big 9% lead. Well, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, right? Because we have to take this margin of error into consideration, right? So if you look in the details of the actual survey, uh, you know, there's sort of a report on it. They'll mention that, you know, the sample size was about, uh, I think there was about 1,200 people in this case. I forgot to write that down. But it's a margin of error about 3.3% at the 95% confidence level. So what that means is if you sampled the same population, all registered voters in the United States, and you did that 100 times on about 95 of those draws, 95 of those samples would represent the total population's preference for Biden somewhere in the range of 45.7% to 52.3%, right? So that's taking 49 minusing 3.3 as your lower threshold, adding 3.3 as your upper threshold. And the same thing with Trump here, he could range anywhere from a low of 36.7 to a high of 43.3, right? So taking into account the margin of error, what that means is, you know, Biden has a, has a statistical lead over Trump. It's not just washed out by the margin of error, right? Because even at his lowest, 45.7%, he still has a lead over Trump at his highest within that margin of error, okay? Now, the important thing to mention about that or to think about, right, is that this is a, a statistical feature, right, of, of, you know, trying to represent the entire adult population. What it means is that at least five of those samples, though, five of those draws, five times out of 100, we might get something that's outside of that margin of error and not represented this population. So even taking into account the margin of error, it could be that this poll is just wrong, right, that we happen to get a random group of people of the adult population that aren't actually that representative. Right, that's a possibility. Now, um, it's not a super high possibility. It's fairly low, right? That's why we use this 95% sort of confidence interval. Um, but it's always there. There's always that possibility. And you can't really get rid of it until you ask every single person uh, in the United States, and in this case, every registered voter in the United States, what their opinion was. Now, outside of uh, sampling error, which I said is really the only thing you can quantify, there are a bunch of other types of error that might creep into our surveys, right? One could be coverage error, which is simply that we don't, uh, not everybody actually has the opportunity to be included in the survey itself, right? So there are various populations that are just hard to reach, right? They might be homeless. They could be military uh, people serving overseas. Um, we can't uh, get in contact with. They could be people in prison or people in other, uh, you know, uh, institutional settings, hospitals, whatever, that we might not be able to reach. Um, they could just simply be on vacation, right? Um, so those are all different ways that we might not reach people um, and so subsequently could miss people that could, uh, change the the answers on our surveys, right? And maybe, and you know, this is usually not that big an issue unless we uh, have reason to believe that some of these people might have certain preferences that align with the reason that they're not being covered in the survey, right? So for example, looking at like homeless people, right? Like homeless people might have certain attitudes that correlate with the fact that they experience homelessness, right? And if we don't have any of those people in our survey, we're going to miss some element of uh, you know, opinions or attitudes that just aren't going to be represented the same way. Um, so that's one kind of error. Another kind of error, and this is a much broader category, and this is the kind of thing that we typically uh, caution people to be aware of, like, you know, students when they're creating their own surveys or whatever, is, is measurement error, right? This, this comes from all different ways that we might not actually measure what we think we're measuring. Right. Um, this could come from problems with the way we word our questions, like leading questions or sort of biased questions or, you know, using certain kind of key phrases that might uh, be problematic. Um, it could have to do with the way that we order our questions. Right. Like, you know, so certain questions, if you place them in a certain sequence, can affect people's attitudes. And there's a lot of really interesting uh, political science research and, and sort of social science research about that. It could be interviewer bias or simple mistakes, right? Like, you know, they fail to uh, accurately uh, write down or code somebody's response. Um, or they could just be badly trained and like, you know, they're really leading people in sort of uh, the way that they ask their questions. Respondents themselves might have a lack of candor, right? Like, heaven forbid, somebody didn't actually tell the truth. Um, that's a possibility, right? And we, when we think about like elections and you ask people about like, you know, uh, who they voted for in the last election, you know, most of us would think, well, it's really hard to forget whether I voted or not in the last presidential election and, you know, who I voted for. But that's actually not true. There's a lot of uh, research that shows that people have can have fairly faulty memories on this, right? Like, you know, the further away you get from an event, the more likely you are to misremember, especially something that's big and salient like a presidential election. It might be that you didn't vote. You had every intention of going to vote and you're a diehard, you know, maybe not diehard, but you're generally a Republican or you're a Democrat or whatever. And you so you're pretty sure that you voted for for Trump, right, in the last election, and he won, right? And so you may not have actually shown up, but because you have an allegiance for that party, uh, you favored that candidate, you intended to vote, 
you might just say like, oh, and he won, right? Like all those factors can sort of uh, move together to sort of help prime your memory to think like, well, yes, of course I voted. I voted for the winner, right? Um, and so those kinds of things happen as well. <clears throat> Now, another category of error can be non-response errors. This gets back to the question somebody asked about cell phones earlier. This is a serious problem, right? Like is if you create a sample, right? Like you want as many of those people that you have randomly sampled to respond, right? Because if they don't respond, then you're potentially missing people uh, in that sample that could represent somebody, uh, you know, this larger population you're trying to, to understand. And if people don't answer, right? If they don't respond simply because they're, they don't want to, take a survey, they don't answer their cell phone, or whatever, that, that can be a problem, right? Because it depresses your response rates, which makes your, you know, your error rate likely to be higher, but that can be really hard to estimate. But especially like when we talk with coverage error, another issue here is that if, and it's really hard to know, right? But like if people refuse to participate in surveys because they have certain attitudes that they just don't want to reveal, right? Then that's a systematic error that's gonna be really problematic when we think, you know, well, maybe a lot of Trump voters, and this was something that uh, a lot of people argued uh, in the 20 run-up to the 2016 election, was that there were a lot of people that ended up voting for Trump that were shy, what they called shy voters, meaning that they weren't willing to reveal their preferences in polls, right? So if that happens and it's systematic, right, like then we're going to miss something big when we think about like, you know, trying to project who a winner for an election is going to be. Uh, and finally, there can still be yet other errors, right? And these might be things like, you know, you think about sort of data processing, like, you know, recording something wrong or, you know, you process something wrong, you, you miscode a variable or whatever. Um, there are other kinds of things because humans are involved um, where we might just mess something up um, and introduce some error into your, into the survey, right? Now, obviously, that, there's a lot of different potential types of error. Um, and it's worth, you know, just mentioning that uh, this doesn't mean that surveys aren't valuable, right? I mean, um, they're the best we have uh, in many cases. It's the only way to figure out some of these things. Um, and so the, we do the best we can to cope with uh, both known and sort of unknown but suspected errors. Um, but it is important just to kind of remember, right, that, you know, none of these things are, are perfect. Um, and, you know, we can't have 100% reliability, um, but we can be fairly reliable, right? And the more that we can sort of quantify what the likely known errors are, the better off we're going to be. Um, and there's a lot of sophisticated work, like I said, in, in social sciences generally. You know, there are whole uh, journals, you know, there's a, a, a big journal in uh, American political science um, called Public Opinion Quarterly, where there's just lots and lots of this kind of stuff is constantly being published, where people look at different survey uh, methods and try to figure out how to correct for different kinds of errors, come up with new ways of doing things so we can get it around some of these types of biases. Um, and like I mentioned a little bit earlier, because of issues like non-response error, um, many survey firms are moving towards these sort of opt-in panels. And what they do is, um, in order to deal with that, um, you know, they will do what's sort of called post-stratification um, adjustments, like weighting the, the survey responses based on how representative somebody is, right? So if you have somebody opt into a panel who's uh, like me, like a white male in his 40s um, within, within a certain uh, income category and educated, whatever, like they know all these things about you because you're on the panel. They can look at the population they're trying to represent and say, okay, we need somebody who's, you know, sort of more or less representative of these kinds of categories. This person is, you know, he's about the right age demographic, about the right, you know, racial demographic, but he's got too much income or too little income or whatever. So we're going to adjust his response. We're going to weight it slightly lower. So it's more representative of the sample we're trying to go for, right? So that's, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute when we look at some examples from the ANES, um, you know, in terms of weighting uh, and how that can affect um, responses. But just to briefly sort of review some different types of uh, public opinion sources, you know, there are major media outlets um, do these, you're familiar with lots of those. Exit polls is another major category. These are the polls that are run on election day as people are leaving the voting booths, right? And so they will use these both to try to project who the winner is going to be that day. That's how, uh, you know, media, TV, uh, and other sort of fora may decide, you know, who they'll call the election before all the vote returns are in. And those are based on exit polls. Um, and they also do this so they can start to get the, a first glance at what demographics uh, seem to correlate with vote choice. Since we don't know that about people in the voting booth, we only know whether somebody showed up to vote or not. Um, you know, we don't know whether they're male or female. Usually uh, that's not recorded on voting registration. Usually race isn't recorded on voting uh, registration, certainly income, 
uh, many other kinds of things aren't recorded. So exit polls helps us to get a, a first glance at that. And election studies fill sort of a, a unique niche here. Um, you know, these are designed specifically by social scientists who want to study elections, especially uh, elections and change over time. Um, they usually happen in, you know, uh, they've been happening in the United States for a long time. Many other countries, especially in the Western, uh, Western Europe uh, and other parts of the world have national election studies that usually happen in conjunction with uh, national par parliamentary elections. So that can vary on the timing in different places. Um, here, they happen every two years. Many of them typ typically have both a pre and a post election wave of the survey where they'll interview a bunch of people before the election, get their responses, who they anticipate voting for, interview them right after the election and say, OK, who did you actually vote for? Uh, and follow up with additional questions so we can sort of track attitude change during the course of the actual election cycle, the campaign itself. Um, and they have very broad and sort of deep uh, set of political questions, you know, so lots of the media sources will have some political questions, but these uh, election studies tend to go into much more depth, which allow us to investigate lots of really interesting questions. Uh, and I have a guy that has some different examples here. Um, but looking at the American National Election Study, uh, like I said, this started back in 1948. So there's a huge, uh, long sort of running history of this. It's been every two years since 1956. Um, each year we'll have sort of an individual file associated with it. We're gonna to look today at the 2016 version of the file. Um, but there's also a cumulative file that runs from basically 1948 uh, to the present and uh, pulls together all the questions that have been asked, I think at least three times um, on the ANES across uh, different years. Looking at the 2016 study, you can see it's a pretty large sample, right? So um, this allows us to get uh, a good uh, tack on sort of the US adult population, their political attitudes with pretty low margin of error, it's roughly around one and a half to 2%. Um, this is split between sort of face to face and online interviews. They have pretty good response rates, considering uh, that response rates for lots of surveys these days are down in the teens. Um, and, you know, if we looked at the code book, and I'll show you that just real briefly here. Um, the code book for the ANES is tw 2,200 pages long. So there's a ton of stuff going on here. Um, right, it's a it's a huge survey. Many many things being um, asked and and uh, tried to figure out. Right, so um, <clears throat> that said, um, we're going to look at sort of a simplified version of this today, just because it's going to make it a little bit easier to navigate. Um, but and I'll send the links out with this later. But there is an uh, UC Berkeley has this great program for doing some online survey analysis, which is what we're going to do today. You know, you don't have to know a ton about statistics to be able to at least run some um, cross tabulations uh, and start to understand, start to dig in a little bit more into the details. So um, on Berkeley's site, they have um, a number of things on here. Um, but they have the ANES on here. They have sort of the most recent several years worth of individual sort of presidential year files, as well as the cumulative file. We're not going to go into that here. Because what I'm going to show you instead is um, ICPSR, if you have access through your university to ICPSR, um, and I should say, so Berkeley's site, the SDA site is, is totally free. It's available to anybody. Um, ICPSR is a membership organization. So if your university belongs, um, you can get access to this. But every year since like the 1970s, they have this, um, oops, this great system called Setups, um, which what does that stand for? Supplementary Empirical Teaching Units in Political Science, um, where in order to sort of start to teach students about how to use um, survey uh, software, how to understand some basic uh, statistics, they use the election year from uh, ANES to guide students through um, some beginning understanding. So this is a great source because it makes for a, a little bit easier navigation. So if I show you here on the SDA uh, version for the 2016 file, this is generally what it looks like. Let me blow that up a little bit. Um, and when you look over here at the questions, if we expand that to the pre-election questions, you can see all these different categories. There's a ton of stuff. And within any one of these categories, there's quite a few different questions. Um, and so when you get into this, this can be really overwhelming because there's a lot going on. So um, the setups version is nice because um, you go here, they've basically some political science professors have taken this and kind of slimmed it down a little bit to make it a bit more manageable for students. So when you look at it, uh, this sort of slimmed down version, what you get is sort of nicely categorized. So the uh, ANES um, on uh, Berkeley's site, uh, the full one is, is a little bit more unwieldy. This one, they've sort of done a nice job of, of trimming out just sort of the key things probably people are going to want to look at and then categorizing them into these different categories like voting behavior, a candidate image, 
ideology, social more issues, right? So it makes it a little bit easier to navigate. So we're going to spend some time kind of going through that uh, today. Um, okay. So what we're going to do here is, <clears throat> oh, that's nice to know, Linda. I didn't know. Um, actually, I think I might have seen that. So in this SDA thing, essentially what you're going to do is uh, we're going to build tables, right, to sort of understand what's going on. Right. So if you look at some of these categories, you can see something like, you know, let's say we want to understand the presidential vote. So we're going to stick that in our row uh, category. So essentially, we're going to think about this row being our dependent variable, what we want to understand, how people's uh, choices differ here. And then we're going to look at some kind of an independent variable, which we're going to place in our column. Essentially, this is a thing that we think might be driving some of those attitudes. Right. So let's start by looking at um, a really basic one. We're going to look at vote choice dependent on people's party identification, okay? And if you look at any one of these things over here, if you click on the view button up here, this will sort of pop open the full code book. Uh, make this a little bit smaller here. Um, where you can see the question text up here, generally speaking, do you consider yourself a Democrat, a Republican, an independent, or what? Right. And you have a strong or not so strong sort of preference right that. So this is a typical what we call party identification scale runs from one to seven. Either I think myself really strong Democrat. I'm a really strong Republican or somewhere in the middle. Um, <clears throat> so if we run this table here, the other thing you need to pay attention to is you're going to put in your row and your column here. Make sure usually by default in this, the software system here, it doesn't apply weights. So we want to apply the weights. And I mentioned that earlier, right, that. The weighting, essentially what it's doing is, it's, this is a slight statistical adjustment to represent the fact that not everybody uh, that ends up in the sample um, should be reflected the same way. And that's because we wanna make sure that this is representative of all these different subpopulations we might be interested in, right? So in order to uh, make sure that this is, is broadly representative, they create these statistical weights. So whenever you're running these tables, you wanna make sure that they have the weights here applied. Now, I'm going to do some other cleanup here. You can include some charts. Uh, mostly, we're going to look at tables. So I'm going to get rid of the charts just to kind of clean up the page. And down here below in these decimal places, it's not really super important. But um, when you're thinking about the number of people representing the survey, and you'll see this in a minute, when we look at the table itself, it'll show us how many respondents showed up in each category, as well as their percentages. Um, I'm going to change this to 0, just because it's easier to think of people as whole people and not as 1.3% of a, or 1.3 people. Um, and now I'm going to run my table. So what you see is it shows us up here what we just did, right? That we have over here vote choice on the row, right? We have party identification up here on the column. And these all sum in columns, right? So you can see here, these all sum up to 100 down all these columns, right? So they show us the percentages within the column. And if you look at across the rows here, we see the total vote choice, right? That 49% of the people here uh, say they voted for Clinton, 44% say they voted for Trump, 7.1% say they voted for somebody else, third party candidate, right? And then um, you'll see sort of the party identification. And you can see some obvious differences here when, you know, clearly not surprisingly, people that identify with Democrats tend to vote for the Democrats. People that identify as Republican vote pretty strongly Republican. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to clean this up, though, just to make this a little bit more obvious. You can do what are called recoding variables, okay? And um, because I'm not going to be interested uh, primarily to make this a little bit easier to see, I don't want to uh, include the third parties here. Let's just be interested in the two parties. It's going to make this a little bit easier to navigate, um, as well as there's a lot of talk in political science research about, like, you know, who are actual independents, right? Are independents really a thing? Some people don't even believe that there are actually any independents. So there are different ways of sort of collapsing this from either from the seven categories that we were seeing here, right? We can collapse this down into a smaller number uh, to say like, let's just look at all those who say they identify with Democrats, even if they sort of lean uh, sort of, you know, weakly or strongly from independents to Democrats, same thing on the Republican side, and we'll include only as independents those people who say they don't lean to one party or the other, right? Because when you look at this, you can see that uh, people that tend to lean one way or the other tend to vote pretty strongly with the party they say they lean towards, right? So let's clean that up a little bit. You can do this a couple different ways. You can do it on the fly here by recoding and saying we want everybody in categories one to three to to show up as a Democrat, whoops. Everybody in category four, that's just the true independence. 
independence, no lean. And then we could say people that fall in categories five to seven, those are the Republicans that lean different ways, are just gonna show up as Republican, right? And if we run that table again, then we'll get this much cleaner table. It makes this a little bit easier to see here. Now we can see sort of the differences um, based on people that identify with one party or another. Um, you can also do the same thing up here with uh, the vote and say like, we only want to have just the people that voted for the two parties. And what this will do is it will drop out everybody else and code them as missing data and not take them into, uh, into consideration when we run our calculations, right? Oops, I did that incorrectly. What did I do? Right. Um, the other thing I'll say, besides doing it on the fly, if you go to recoding variables, this will, whoops, that was the help. I meant to go up here. I'm gonna create variables, you go to recode variables. Um, it'll take you to this little thing where you can fill in basically what I was doing there. Um, it might seem a little bit more clear to do it this way. But what you can do is then you can save variables so that you can reuse them later. So you can see I've already done this for some of these things. You know, I create just the two parties where I code for Clinton and Trump and I drop out the third party candidates. Um, you can do the same thing with this party identification category. So I've done some of that ahead of time just to make this a little bit quicker here. Um, so if we go back to our analysis. You have to redo all this stuff because it knocks it out. Do that, oops, wrong one. We want the vote choice by this new collapsed party identification. And so what you see is um, when we look at just sort of the two party vote based on party identification, you can see like obviously people that have a partisanship very strongly support their party, right? Um, it's, you know, this is one of the most sort of overwhelming uh, influences that we know of uh, in terms of determining people's vote choices. Um, and with independence, true independence, they're much more evenly split, right? And you can see that they tended to break a little bit more towards Trump uh, in the election overall, 2016, okay? Um, so just for sake of time to make this a little bit faster, I'm not gonna be going uh, and running all the tables individually, um, but I've got them here on my screen. <clears throat> So, you know, we looked at this uh, party identification, and that's a pretty strong influence, right? But what about people that don't vote, right? So we were just looking at people that say they did vote. Um, and if you notice, the, the total number here is only about 2,500 people, and there are about 3,650 people uh, that completed both the pre- and the post-election survey that we're looking at here. Um, so there's quite a few people that don't vote that don't show up in this table. So what about them, right? So if we rerun this and say, like, let's look at, everybody, right, and look at this in relation to their party identification. Um, if we don't drop out that missing data, what we can see here is, um, you know, still you see pretty strong, um, you know, correlation between partisanship and vote. But what you'll notice is, you know, Democrats, of those who say that they identify as Democrats, about 22% and about 20% of Republicans, people that say they identify as Republicans, didn't vote in the 2016 election, right? But look how many independents, people that say they're true independents, they don't lean one way or the other, more than half of them said they didn't bother to vote, right? And uh, so that's pretty, that's pretty, that's a pretty strong effect, right? It's pretty remarkable that we're missing a pretty large group of people that are just are clearly turned off to sort of the partisan polarization in the country. And so consequently, they're not voting. And thanks, Chris, I see your note of what I did wrong earlier, that's helpful. Um, hopefully I won't be doing too much more of that. Okay, um, so <clears throat> moving on from sort of party identification, let's look at another example here, right? So if we look over here in the categories, there are lots of issue categories that ask about people's attitudes on things. Um, one of those areas might be something like, um, you can see all these different things here, you know, government regulation, environmental protection or whatever. If we looked at something like social, government spending on social security, now this wasn't a huge issue in the 2016 election. Um, but, you know, uh, Democrats generally um, have favored increasing spending on Social Security. Republicans have tended to either favor just their sort of the status quo or even reducing spending. Trump was kind of ambiguous on this in the election. Um, but if you look at this, you know, they just ask this question, should the government increase spending on Social Security? Increase it, stay the same or decrease? And you can see sort of these. And now these are not weighted. So if you ever actually want to see what the sort of the weighted values of these are, you can run this just in the row table here and say, okay, let's just run the table. 
And you can see here, about 60% of people say we should increase it, 35% say, or 34% say, say stay the same, 60% want to decrease social security spending, right? Um, <clears throat> so this wasn't necessarily a huge issue, but this is a useful thing to think about, how does it affect people's vote choices, right? So if we look at this in terms of the two-party vote, and we say, okay, let's see how this affected people's uh, vote choices, right? We see that at least there's a correlation, right? That people that wanted to increase on um, social security spending tend to vote for Clinton. Those that like the status quo or wanted to reduce it tend to vote Republican, right? Um, and yes, Rachel, we will, I will definitely send these out afterwards. <clears throat> um, so that's pretty interesting, right? Um, what about though, if we sort of modify this, right? Like what, do, what we wanna know though is, does that actually drive people's vote choice? Right? Um, is it that, you know, Social Security really matters to a lot of people and that's why they voted for Clinton uh, over Trump? Well, one way to think about trying to investigate that would be to think about controlling for uh, Social Security on the basis of people's party identification, right? So if we went back to the table here and we left this as it was, right? Or actually, we might sort of recode this here to say, you know, what I want to do is I'm going to make this just a little bit clearer. So let's just say, we only want to look at increase versus everybody else who is same or decrease, right? And then we want to control for this on the basis of party identification. We'd get a different look, right? And so this is a little bit clear, but I'm going to go back to the slide because it's a little easier to see horizontally than it is to see uh, vertically. But what you'll notice is when you look at this, <coughs> It doesn't seem to be driving people's choices, right? Because partisans, Demo people that identify as Democrats, whether they favor increasing or decreasing spending didn't change really at all, whether they voted for Clinton or not. Um, same thing over here with Republicans, you know, you don't see really hardly any difference down in these cells um, down here. You do see a difference for the independents, but it goes the opposite of the way you might expect, right? So people that want the status quo or want to decrease funding seem to vote for Clinton more than they voted for Trump. Right, so that seems sort of counterintuitive. So we can sort of, you know, reject that hypothesis that it doesn't really seem to be driving people's opinions uh, in this particular case. Um, so this is the kind of example, uh, these are examples of the kinds of things you can do when you start to dig into this a little bit more. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, let's look at something like gender and the vote, right? If we were to run this, um, and I've collapsed out in the most recent surveys for the ANES, they actually include now a non-binary gender category. There's not very many people there, so just to make this a little bit cleaner, I've dropped them because they're a very, very small percentage of, of the total people here. You could include them if you wanted to do this on your own. Um, but looking at this as sort of males and females uh, and their preferences in sort of the two-party vote who they say they voted for, you can see here a really, pretty stark difference in females, right? That females preferred Clinton by a fairly substantial margin here, right? Um, males were more evenly split. Um, and you might think, well, maybe this is because, you know, Hillary was the sort of the first major party uh, female nominee for president. But actually, uh, if you go and look in the uh, Berkeley's SDA archive and look at the cumulative file over uh, multiple years, what you will see is that this is actually something that has existed for a while, right? Um, so it's fluctuated over time. This is the sort of vote for president by year of this study for males up here on top and females down here on bottom. And you can see that basically since 92, everybody voted for Clinton, but 96, you start to see this divide between males who are fairly evenly split and females now are pretty predominant in voting for the Democrats, right? And this continues to persist throughout many election cycles now for 20 years, right? So that leads to an interesting question, like what's driving that, right? There's actually a lot of research that looks at this, but you know, we could do some investigation of this on our own um, in uh, using the ANES here. So what we could do is um, come back in and let's think about like abortion, right? Like maybe it's abortion attitudes. This might be what we would call sort of a confounding variable, right? It might be that what's happening actually maybe an intervening very better way to say this is that um, people's abortion attitudes I and mean, women are going to have certain abortion attitudes different than men um, we might hypothesize and so subsequently that will lead them to vote for the party that think is going to be more supportive of abortion rights right so uh, you know you can look at this there's a, a, a item here on abortion attitudes and if we look at this you can see there's sort of four categories um, to make this a little bit simpler, we might just collapse these into two categories that, you know, generally we're opposed to abortion, 
Uh, and generally, we think there shouldn't be very many restrictions, if any restrictions on abortion, right? So if we were to rerun uh, that previous table on gender in the vote, but use abortion attitudes as a control, we'll see something slightly different, right? Which is um, now we can see broken out by those who either uh, don't support um, abortion um, and people who think that they that, that support abortion don't think there should be very many limits, if any limits at all. And what you notice is, so here's our gender split from before up here in the corner. You'll notice that this is about, you know, five and a half percent difference, right? Um, male, females to males. And it's still roughly the same proportions here in both of these categories. So it looks like abortion attitudes, while important, clearly important in driving people's vote choices, right? Those that don't uh, support abortion voted much more strongly for Trump. Those who do voted much more strongly for Clinton. But that doesn't seem to be accounting for this gender disparity, right? Um, so you'd have to keep fishing to try and figure out, well, what might be driving that? And I'll leave that for you to explore on your own. Um, what are we doing on time? All right, I'm going to end up having to cut some of this out, but I'll leave all the slides in so you can look some of these later. Um, looking at another one, looking at uh, how about like voter candidate uh, images, right? So we think about like, how did people assess the two different candidates, Clinton and Trump? How honest do people think they were? Right. Um, so if you ask them, does the label sort of being honest, sort of extremely well represent this candidate or not well at all? And sort of this uh, this range here, you can see these breakdowns. This one is for Clinton. Uh, you can see it kind of varies. But, you know, the large plurality, almost a majority of people say we don't think she's honest. Same thing for Trump. He's a little bit less because he's a little bit less known of a quantity maybe at that point. Um, but still, large plurality say that neither one of these people is honest. Right. If you run this um, sort of separate tables here and look at, okay, what is the effect of people that think that Trump is honest or not on their vote for president? Um, as you can see, not surprisingly, people that think that candidate uh, Trump is not very honest are highly, highly likely to vote for Clinton in the election. Think that people that think he is honest are highly likely to vote for Trump. And the same thing goes for Clinton, right? If we run the same table, it just flips perspectives, right? So the more interesting question becomes, well, what about people that perceive the candidates differently, right? So people that think that Trump is honest, that think that Hillary was dishonest, or people that uh, thought that they were both basically honest or both basically dishonest, how does that affect people's vote choice, right? So we can do that by adding in one of these as a column um, and the other one as a control to see uh, these variations here. So if we were to do that, what we would see is something kind of interesting here, right? Um, you can see that not surprisingly, so this is looking at uh, this one up here is for those people that thought that Donald Trump was honest. This table is for those people who thought he was dishonest. And up here, this is do 4 is for Clinton's honesty assessment. So people that thought that Hillary was honest and Trump was honest, you can see if you look at the frequencies down here, about 119 out of the sample, 966. So a very small number of people actually thought that they were both basically honest, right? Um, not terribly surprising, right? And so I've recoded the honesty here. So one to three is honest, four to five is dishonest, right? So you can see that not very many people think they're both honest. Um, a much larger group think that they're both basically dishonest. And then you have a fairly substantial per portion of people that think that one is honest and the other is dishonest, right? So looking at that, um, not terribly surprisingly, if we look at people that thought that Trump was honest, but Clinton was dishonest, they overwhelmingly voted for Trump. Same thing over here, if you look at it, just kind of vice versa. Interesting to look at though, if uh, they thought that both candidates were basically honest, they broke for Clinton much more uh, strongly here. And if they thought they were both basically dishonest, they also broke for Clinton um, at roughly similar margins, right? Now, <clears throat> Um, what about if we sort of, um, oops, I'm oh, sorry, I'm going to slide behind on my paper here. All right, so shifting gears a little bit more, let's look at, I'm running out of time, let's look at immigration, right? This is a pretty salient issue in the election. Um, there's a question on here, K11, ask people, you know, do you think that we should increase uh, the number of, sort of in terms of the desirable immigration level, should it go up, should it be the same, should it decrease a little bit, should it decrease a lot, right? And if you look at this based on its influence on people's uh, vote for president, not surprising you see that people that favor the status quo or want it to go up, voted for Clinton, uh, given all his anti-immigrant uh, rhetoric, Trump 
uh, garnered the people that wanted to reduce immigration, right? And if we collapse this, we recode these so that, you know, one and two here are basically sort of keep it the same or increase it. And these people are the decrease, so reduce immigration. Um, you can see it's a pretty strong effect, right? So about 74% in each category um, voting sort of the way you would expect. Um, <clears throat> However, if we, if we start to ask, well, why is that, right? Is that what's driving people's vote? Um, there could be a couple of reasons why that might be. Like one might be the effect that immigration, people hypothesize its effect on jobs, right? So maybe there's a seg segment of the population that thinks that you know, immigration's uh, likely to reduce jobs for Americans. And so consequently, we wanna reduce immigration. And so we're gonna vote for somebody who champions that platform, right? So this question here on terms of immigration reduces jobs, you can see that, uh, fairly evenly, evenly split across the four categories of, yes, it's very likely to reduce American jobs, or no, it's not at all likely to reduce American jobs, right? And so if we add that as a control on our previous table here, you can see now that we're looking at people that think uh, in this table, it's very likely, uh, it's somewhat likely or very likely to reduce American jobs. In this one, it's somewhat or uh, very like unlikely to reduce American jobs. How did that affect their vote choice, right? So for those people who think it's likely to reduce American jobs and that want to subsequently decrease immigration, they voted very strongly for Trump, right? In comparison to that 74%, it's a pretty sizable jump, about six and a half percent or so, right? Um, if you look at people, uh, though, that think it's likely to reduce American jobs, but just kind of want the status quo to stay, it was much more evenly split, right? But if you look at people that think, well, immigration's effect on American jobs is actually not that big, or they don't think it's likely to reduce American jobs, you know, Im immigrants likely uh, fill jobs that people don't want, then it's a bit more of a mixed picture, right? So people that want to still decrease immigration, they still voted for Trump overwhelmingly, but at a, at a lower rate, right? A, a noticeably lower rate here of about 7%, actually almost 10%, I guess. Um, whereas those who want sort of the status quo or increase it because they don't think this has an effect on jobs, were much more likely to vote for Clinton. Right. So it's interesting, right? Like it doesn't tell us exactly why, um, but we can make some hypotheses, right? And this is where you'd bring sort of your theoretical expectations into this to say like, well, maybe in this case, people that think that it's likely to reduce American jobs want to reduce immigration levels because they feel a personal threat. Whereas people that think that it does reduce jobs, but they are fine with the level of immigration as it is, maybe they don't feel a personal threat. They just see a general threat. And so consequently, they're likely to, less likely to be motivated by this to vote according to that issue. Right. That's one possible explanation. We wouldn't know for sure um, without some additional investigation, um, but that's another possibility. We could also look at this slightly differently by looking at, there's an issue, uh, a variable on here, a question where they have sort of, they've taken multiple questions about how people feel about immigrants and created sort of this index of tolerance towards immigrants, right? Um, we come back over here and look at this variable. You can see up here, um, it ranges from sort of one to high, either people are very low tolerance, or they're high tolerance, and it's built from these various questions, you know, something like immigrants are generally good for America's economy, or America's cultural is, har is harmed by immigrants. Uh, there are, I think, four questions on there that they use to kind of um, create that index. And so if we run that then, um, and look at its effect on people's vote choice, we can see that people that are very tolerant of immigrants tend to vote for Clinton, those that are less tolerant tended to vote for Trump. Not terribly surprising, uh, given sort of their positions. But if we sort of problematize this just a little bit and say like, okay, what about uh, the effect of party identification? Because we know that party identification is a really strong effect on people. How does that interact with this tolerance towards immigrants, right? So I've run that here with party ID as a control. And now we have sort of three tables here. So here's the original table up here in the corner. And down here you can see for Democrats, for Republicans and for independents separately, that you can see here that those that had the most tolerance among Democrats still voted very high rates for Clinton, as you would expect based on their partisanship. Um, you know, 92% of Democrats voted for Clinton, so that's not a big surprise there. But you'll notice that she had some defections here amongst Democrats who were less tolerant of immigrants, right? They were less likely to vote for Clinton, more likely to vote for Trump. And you'll see sort of a flip on that with Republicans. Those that were most tolerant of immigrants were less enthusiastic about Trump, right? By almost sort of 20 points here, in comparison to just all of them in general, it's a pretty substantial, about 15%, right? Uh, drop here in, in those that uh, supported Republican uh, candidate, Donald Trump. 
Uh, independence a bit more mixed, right? So you see sort of this is an issue that seemed to really split independence, right? Those that were high tolerance, uh, much more likely to vote for Clinton. Those that were low tolerant uh, of immigrants, much more likely to break for Trump. So we are probably just about out of time. So I'm gonna skip ahead just a little bit. Um, the next couple of ones are actually pretty interesting. These are about um, education. I'll sort of skip that, uh, and let you look at those afterwards. Um, but I wanna end with this one. This is about race. So thinking about um, race and, and the vote, right? If we look at sort of initially sort of party identification, one of the things you notice is if we look at race as it relates to how people identify with parties, Republicans are overwhelmingly white, Democrats much more diverse right, in that sense. Um, you know, it's much more evenly split, Republicans 85, 15, right? Um, if we look at, there's another, uh, one of these index that sort of combines multiple questions about supports for blacks, right? So there's a lot of talk about, you know, how race affects uh, different people's votes in the election. Um, I sort of collapse this into sort of broadly supportive um, and broadly unsupportive of blacks um, based on these questions. Uh, this is over here, if you look at this M06, you can get a kind of a sense. Actually, I think I have it up on the code book so you can see. Uh, it's built from these statements. Things like Irish, Irish, Italians, Jewish, and many other minor, minorities overcame prejudice and worked their way up. Blacks should do the same without any special favors. Uh, other kinds of things, blacks have gotten less than they deserve. You know, So they scale these things and combine these uh, attitude um, onto this one index to create uh, this notion of how tolerant people might be, either low support to high support. Right. So I sort of recoded those um, so that one to, I think one to three is low support and four and five is high support. Okay. So looking at that, if you look at that uh, effect on vote choice, you can see like it's, it's pretty strong, right? That uh, those who voted for Clinton uh, correlated with very high support for blacks. Um, those who voted for Trump correlated with very low support for blacks. Um, <clears throat> so what about when we look at this in comparison to uh, their party identification. Um, what you can see is, um, <clears throat> actually, so I've done a couple of things here. This is a little more complicated. So let me go back to the online thing and just show you. So there's also this notion where you can use a selection filter, right? So what I wanna do is, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, obviously race as a, um, you know, and white voters and, and what they thought of in the election and how the race, their attitudes towards race may have inter impacted their vote, right? So what I'm doing here is we're looking at this uh, black support index related to people's vote and their party identification, but we're looking now just at whites, right? Just at white voters. So you can see this selection filter here. When you're in the thing here, this is right here. So if we wanted to look at people's race, which if you look down in the demographics down here is this RO2, we would say, I wanna just look at all those that are white. So there are multiple categories here if you look at race. Um, and generally I've, um, I've recorded them, I've collapsed them to be sort of white and everybody else that's not white because there's uh, not as many people. Obviously you could investigate this more, but we're just interested right now in kind of looking at white attitudes. So I've selected to just, just look at whites in this case. And when you look at that, what you see for whites is we have now broken up between sort of those who have low support for blacks and those who have high support for blacks. And what you'll see is, um, you know, those who have low support for blacks very predominantly supported Republicans, those high support for blacks very predominantly uh, voted for Democrats. It's not terribly surprising given some of the things that we've heard and know. What's more interesting is to look at sort of this split in the Democrats, right? That Clinton had some major defections here in terms of the white vote. Um, this is the total white vote based on party identification, right? Um, that 87% of white Democrats voted for Clinton, say they voted for Clinton. You can see almost a 20 point drop in those who had low support for blacks, right? So there seems to be um, a pretty strong effect of racial attitudes driving this difference in support between uh, amongst the parties themselves, right? And you can even see this with Republicans, it's a little bit less stark, um, but you can see that those that were um, have high supports for black, um, a little bit less likely to support Trump than sort of this 93%, about a 10% drop, but not as significant as the one you see amongst Democrats, which may give some credence to the talk about, you know, sort of democratic defections in 2016 um, amongst whites. Uh, the slides I didn't have a chance to show you um, had to do with education. And one of the things it shows is that um, lower educated whites, whites that don't have college degrees, um, Trump overperformed with that group uh, in a pretty strong way. So. Anyway, uh, I know that was super fast, um, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to take questions, but I hope that's at least uh, whetted your appetite and wanted 
to make you get in and just kind of play around with this because there's so much interesting stuff in here. I mean, we've barely begun to scratch the surface. And this is just a simplified version of the ANES, like I said. Um, you know, the full ANES has many, many more items that you can look at, many more uh, variables about the respondents themselves that you can uh, look at. And, you know, you could look at things like income and how that correlates with attitudes um, and many, many other things besides. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, uh, sorry, the noise outside. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeremy. This is awesome. I haven't uh, played with AINS quite this much. Um, and there's a, a, you mentioned this, I think, in the beginning, but the voting behavior module has some exercises you can go through to get. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In yeah. fact, some of the, some of the things I put up here come directly from the exercises, but if you, uh, if you can have access to ICPSR, you can come through here and there's a whole series of exercises. These are great just to do on your own. They'll walk you through it and help you get familiar mm -hmm. with uh, running the data analysis. Um, and so these talk about different types of categories just to kind of get you familiar. And then once you've done those, um, you can certainly play around more on your own. They're also great if you want to, you know, use these as examples with students. You know, this is a great way of getting students interested in both looking at public opinion data, um, as well as starting to think kind of in terms of statistical relationships. You know, this opens up great opportunities, I think, in the teaching environment as well. Yeah, and I think, well, I know at UNCG, they just, this is how they actually get political science students started doing statistics yeah. is through the, the voting behavior. Yeah, um, it's so a great, it's a great resource. Awesome. Thank you so much. And there's a, a lot of people saying thank you. Um, yes, definitely much easier <laughs> than using SPSS. Yeah, that's, the, that's one thing I didn't say, which is, just, uh, you know, all of this data is available for download, right? So if you want to play around with it, if you know a statistical software package like R or Stata or SPSS, all these things are freely downloadable. You can um, download the full data sets and play around with your heart content. Uh, to your heart's content and do much more sophisticated stuff than what we're just doing. But you know, I wanted to keep this at least simple enough so that people that you know aren't real familiar with those packages can do um, some pretty interesting things and get a, a good sense of what's going on with attitudes, um, short of having you know sort of a high-powered uh, knowledge of statistics. And uh, yes, definitely. And Phyllis was asking about the YouTube channel. Um, I just put a link in um, the chat. Um, I'll, we will send out. The recording to everyone, um, and the. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll send my slides too. So we'll send the those. slides with the presentation. We don't have send the chat with the presentation just because it's identifiable. But we'll, we'll send the um, slides with uh, this presentation, and um, as well as the the YouTube link, um, so you'll have all of that. Um, and feel free if you know. I, like I said, I'm not uh, the expert on this, but if you have questions um, just about political opinion uh, polls and stuff in general, I'm always happy to field those if you're looking for things. You know, I, I do a lot of those kinds of uh, questions and answers. So uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Um, I don't know that I put my uh, email address in the presentation. I'll make sure it's there when I send the slides to Linda. Yes, that, awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely get that in there. Thank you so much, everybody. And um, uh, yeah. Thank you for coming. It was a great turnout. And thank you so much, Jeremy, for a very rich presentation. <laughs> it's exciting to see. I haven't played around oh, with it welcome. in a while. So uh, yeah. good to see Especially you. Especially as we go into the, into the fall. It's interesting yes. To think. <laughs> Get ready for that. Yeah. So, awesome. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful uh, rest of your Thursday and a great Friday. And um, we will see you in September. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay. Bye.